In this episode, we're talking about oilcloth. Oilcloth was a very popular item in the 18th century. It was used in a lot of different ways, and it was kind of important to people in the frontier if they had access to it. There are many different references uh, to oilcloth being used for uh, ground cloths on the ground uh, or like a carpet, but they also used it for garments. Uh, they would you know, cover up different articles to protect them from the weather. They might even use different pieces of oil cloth as a tent structure in and of itself. So uh, oil cloth was used in so many different ways. One of the recipes even starts off with the title, How to Make Oil Cloth, Ver a very necessary item for country people or any that travel in wet weather. So you can see that oil cloth was um, popular for people in the country because they had to deal with the weather all the time. And even in the city, people used uh, oil cloth covers for, to protect their expensive hats from getting wet. So let's get started on making some oil cloth. Let's discuss the ingredients of the preparation we need to put on our cloth to turn it into oil cloth. Uh, in the time period, they would have started with something like raw linseed oil and they would have boiled it with a lead litharge. Sometimes we call golden litharge or white litharge. Uh, that is a, like a lead oxide, very poisonous. Uh, so we're not going to be using that today. We're not going to boil our own linseed oil. We're going to use pre-boiled linseed oil that we can buy at the hardware store. It's not made quite the same way. Uh, they actually use um, you know, modern petroleum distillates to turn it into this boiled linseed oil. Uh, but it's going to work exactly the same way. It's going to be a lot safer and, and we, we skip a step. So we've got boiled linseed oil here. Uh, that is a real interesting kind of a, a, a finish, but to get it to really dry out and to dry out properly, we're going to have to add another drying agent. And we're going to actually add a turpentine or um, more likely you're going to find in the store something like mineral spirits similar kind of thing. It's a paint thinner, right? It's going to thin this and it's going to cause it to dry more rapidly. So we just have these two ingredients. If we wanted to dry it even more quickly, we could add an ingredient called Japan Dryer. And that's another petroleum distillate prod, uh, product that will dry this uh, linseed oil even faster. We're not going to necessarily use that today, but that is a possibility. We're going to put these two ingredients sort of in a 50-50 mix here, um, one part each, and then we're going to add our colorant. Now we could use it just like that, but if you look at a fabric like this linen that we've got that we're going to stretch out here and, and apply this to, there are actually little holes in it. If we hold it up to the light, we can see little holes. And if we, what we really need to do is fill up those holes so that this paint-like product will um, totally coat this so that water can't get through even those little pinholes. So we're going to add a, a colorant which is just going to sort of add body to our paint. We could use several different things. One of the popular ones in the time period was an oxide, uh, an iron oxide, basically rust. And that comes in several different colors. I've got a red iron oxide here. There are other uh, colors of that if you're looking for say other colors of cloth. This is going to turn out to be a dark red one, just like the, the, the uh, cloth that's behind me. We could also try something like um, calcium carbonate, which is chalk, uh, that or whiting in the time period it was called also. You could add that and turn it into sort of a white paint. There are other colors too, ochres, um, other kinds of ingredients that we could add to get to other colors. And really all we're making here is a very primitive oil-based paint. So let's mix these ingredients up. I've got my boiled linseed oil. I've got the, uh, the turpentine or the mineral spirits. I'm gonna add that in there. I don't wanna sort of overfill it. It doesn't have to be perfect in getting this mixed together uh, just right. We do wanna get it so that it's completely mixed and uh, it's gonna be a lot harder to get this, um, this pigment mixed in. It'll take a little bit of stirring. Uh, the important part about this pigment is that it's very, very finely ground. You don't, you don't want anything that's, uh, it should be as finely pulverized as possible. Uh, this, uh, this iron oxide is nice and finely powdered and we can just start to mix that in. And it, it actually mixes pretty well. So 
So our mixture looks pretty good. It might be a little thin until I start to paint with it. I'm not, I won't know exactly. It's, you know, like an experiment every time. I've got my nice little brush here that I made earlier with horsehair and a stick. And here's the fabric. And this is a fairly tightly woven uh, linen fabric, just a natural, uh, inexpensive linen. And we've stretched it out onto a frame. And if you read in the uh, the, the recipes and it talks about making oil cloth they always talk about stretching it out on a frame you want it you know nailed out so that you can get to both sides of it and so that it's nice and tight unless it's stretched out like this it won't dry properly so uh, we stretch it out onto a frame here and I'm just gonna start painting it on and let's uh, we'll find out really quick if we've got our paint so that it's thick enough and wow it already um, really looks <laughs> Uh, like it's uh, got enough pigment in it. So I think that's it's gonna work out really well. So let's talk a little bit about the longevity of this. Um, uh, I've had some mixed results, and I'm not sure exactly why, but I've got a sort of a hint. If you read online, uh, some people uh, are talking about boiled linseed oil, especially this modern version, being very acidic when it's done. And possibly even, even it was acidic in the time period. You take this linseed oil, you boil it with these uh, different kinds of um, uh, metallic uh, oxide hardeners or dryers and it uh, makes it so that it's acidic and it will actually start to eat up the fabric. So here's a piece that I made uh, several different years ago or several years ago and you can see that it definitely is has been weakened and sort of sort of eaten up and um, I'm thinking that that definitely was the issue with this that the um, the acidity of this mixture slowly ate away at the fabric of the fabric. Well, if you look at this tarp that's behind me here, that tarp I made, um, I think it was last, last summer. And it's still in extremely good shape. In fact, I haven't found any place on it that has um, deteriorated in that same way. And in fact, this deterioration probably started, um, you know, it, you could probably see deterioration within six months or a year. So I'm interested to understand what the differences were between those two pieces. And I think it has to do with the actual use in this case. Um, if I recall correctly, after I made that piece, I just sort of folded it up or um, it, it uh, dried in a very safe place um, out of the weather. And uh, this piece, basically I made it and put it on that frame almost right away so that it dried out in the weather. And that's one of the issues with this uh, stuff. It's going to take quite a while to dry and not be, um, to, to not still be sticky. Unlike regular paint that we think of today that, you know, dries up in a day or two, uh, this fabric, uh, it might take six weeks to dry. Uh, depending on the environment that you're working in. I would say that on a day like today, or if you have a lot of weather like today, that it's fairly warm and uh, low humidity, that this will dry very, very rapidly. And so this, this may be dried up in a week or maybe just a couple of days. But that piece was, uh, had the weather uh, attack it right away. And it could be that the weather actually washed away some of that acidity and kept uh, that actually in better shape. I'm not sure. It could be the version of the boiled linseed oil that I used. Maybe that particular batch was less acidic. That's just one of those experiments where you have to do it several different times to find out. Okay, that finishes this piece up. And let's take a look at the back real quick. There's the back. And you can kind of see that really it's come all the way through and it looks really good. 
I can kind of look at it uh, through the light with the light behind it to see if it's got, uh, we can see whether the pigment has filled in the holes. So if you're really, uh, you want to know if that's working out well, make sure to look at it up against the light and you'll probably still see a few little holes. So uh, that's okay because what we're going to do is we might come back after a few days. This will be partially dried or mostly dried out. And we can go ahead and give it another coat if we have a lot of little holes. Those, those little holes will bring in, we'll let the moisture through, especially if you get like a pounding rain, you'll get a mist on the, on the back side of it if you've got little holes uh, where the pigment doesn't fill it in. Uh, if you still want it to be more flexible and lightweight, then you might only give it one coat but uh, if we want it to be nice and waterproof, second coat's going to work. Again, we're just going to leave this uh, basically out here. We're going to let it dry out, stretched out the whole time uh, for as long as it takes for it to get dry. And if it does get in places, uh, say like up against the wood here, it might not dry very rapidly. Um, but if we were going to turn this into something else, we'd probably cut all these edges off anyway so it won't matter on that tarp that was back there where it laid against the frame it took a long time to dry out but it did eventually completely dry out so uh, that's all we need to do this this uh, oil cloth will dry out and then then it'll be ready to use and we can use it for all kinds of things we could uh, use it for a haversack if we wanted a bag that was waterproof. We could use it for a tarp just like we've used it back here. We could make ourselves a hat cover. We could use it as a, as a waterproof covering for all sorts of things. So uh, a very, very useful item. If you're out here in the wilderness and you need to protect something from the weather, you're going to need at least a little bit of oilcloth to help you uh, keep things dry. So before I leave you in this episode, I've got, I, won't, I really have to cover safety on this situation. Linseed oil, uh, mineral spirits, turpentine, all that stuff. If you've ever heard of oily rags bursting into flames spontaneously, well they do. And this is just the kind of a classic project that, for that to happen. Uh, that's why, one of the reasons why this is all stretched out so it can air out properly and dry. You want to have this in a, in, a, in a place where it can dry nice and, and rapidly. If you've got rags, dispose of them properly. Uh, you don't want to have a problem with anything like that. Also, if you're using this oil cloth as a tent um, or a tent-like structure, know that it is very flammable. It is not like a modern tent fabric that's specifically made to be uh, flame resistant to at least a small extent. That's one of the things that happens with modern day tents. That's what's so nice about them is that they don't burst into flame immediately. Well this stuff, if you uh, get to too, it too close to the flames, you know, too close to your fire, you might very well have a problem like that. So you certainly have to be much more wary of using a, a, a thing like this as a tent um, item. You can see that like the, the lean-to that we've got back here, it's a long distance away from the fire so uh, we don't have any problems with that. I want to thank you guys uh, for all your great support and coming along today on this adventure where we're making up oil cloth and uh, you know I do so many different kinds of projects like this and it's great fun to learn about them especially learn about them so that I can you know do a video like this so it's always great fun. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for all your support sharing our videos, uh, going to our uh, store, our website, whatever you do. So thanks for all you do, and thanks for watching.